sir. No from the underground. Hello, this is The Underground, the podcast where we talk about the world and how crazy and weird and messed up it is. I'm your host, Duncan Michael McPherson. Uh, so today on the podcast, what I'd like to talk about is something that I've, I mentioned before. Uh, I talked about it a little bit before in a previous podcast, but I want to talk about it again because I think uh, it's very important and it keeps getting dismissed, and that's free speech. So... Um, yeah, I want to discuss the importance of free speech and kind of apply some of it to what's going on in the world today with social media and things like that. So, uh, before we get started, you're going to notice that I, I have this duct tape thing on my hand. I burnt my hand cooking bacon, grease burn, and it hurts really bad. And this seems to be a good remedy, even though it's not very attractive for a, po- for a podcast or a video. Um, I guess just the video, the podcast people don't care at all about what my hand looks like. Um, anyway, so, um, I want to look at, uh, a philosopher, John Stuart Mill, who, uh, wrote a book called On Liberty. And so in On Liberty, he talks about freedom of speech, particularly in chapter two. And so I want to go through three arguments from John Stuart Mill. And then one extra thing that I think is vitally important um i think it's in the first argument he talks about uh social um social censorship so a lot of times when we talk about free speech we're talking about government censorship of speech and that's very important but what's happening today with social media is the private censoring of free speech or even people uh censoring themselves and so he talks a little bit about why that's so dangerous. And I think that's going to be the most important thing that I have to offer to this. Really, with the rest of the arguments, I, would, I just want to like point out examples from this whole COVID situation. Um, that's my dog. Um, there's some examples of this whole COVID situation that, can, that we can apply these, these arguments about free speech uh, to make them more concrete, I think. So... Let's get into it. So this is On Liberty uh, by John Stuart Mill. You can find it. Um, there's a really nice uh, artist, artistic uh, 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 version of this that somebody did artwork for uh, at the Heterodox Academy, um, which is uh, something started by Jonathan Haidt. I, I don't know if I'm saying his last name right. But um, anyway, it's called All Minus One, and it's just chapter two with some art to it. It's It's beautiful. Okay, so let's look at uh, the first argument that he makes. So the the first the first argument for so I'm arguing in favor of free speech. This is why free freedom of speech is so essential and important in our society, in any society, right? So the first argument is he says first the opinion which is attempted to suppress by authority may possibly be true. Um. Let me just read this whole part. Those who desire to suppress it, of course, deny its truth, but they are not infallible. They have no authority to decide the question for all mankind and exclude every other person from the means of judging. To refuse a hearing to an opinion because they are sure that it is false is to assume that their certainty is the same thing as absolute certainty. All silencing of discussion is an assumption of infallibility. So, the argument here is, is uh, I think this one's pretty clear, right? Is that you might be wrong in your opinion, right? And even if your opinion is something that you're sure is right, um, there might be something missing. And he kind of talks about that more in a different argument about how it's not an all or nothing uh, idea of truth and that the, the arguments against your opinion might have some elements of truth that your truth is missing if that makes sense. So uh, this one is important because, uh, you know, you might be wrong about something. So, for example, the lab leak theory is getting a lot of press lately. I have never talked about the lab leak theory on this podcast because, well, because it was, I think because it was such an, an, um, um, what's the word I'm looking for? A controversial opinion. And because there was not, like, proper evidence yet. 
So one of the first things I posted about COVID at all on on Facebook and possibly other platforms um, was the pandemic video. Now, this video was very controversial. It was done by anti-vaxxers. It had a lot of things in it that were false. Um, and I said that when I posted. I said, there's a lot of stuff in here that I don't buy. But if some of this is true, and some of the things we were talking about was the lab leak theory, that Anthony Fauci was uh, part of the funding towards the Wuhan lab for coronavirus uh, studies. Um, if you've seen Jon Stewart's thing, <laughs> where he comes out and uh, admits that the, the lab leak theory is like almost undeniable, it's pretty funny. Anyway, um, so there was some things in the video that I thought, you know, if these things, and I said like in my post, if these things are true, that they're saying, if even some of these things that they're saying are true, we should be questioning the authority with which people are speaking from, like Anthony Fauci. Um, we should be more aware of the biases that might be coming into play and the money that is involved in this and the possible bad intentions of people who have a lot to gain from vaccines and things like that. So. I wasn't saying that I'm an anti-vaxxer. I wasn't saying that everything in the video was accurate because it definitely was not. And I, I definitely disagree with, I, I think I would even go as far as to say I disagree with most of it. But there was some things that were concerning that were ignored because it was packaged in this, uh, you know, in this way of anti-vaxxers, right? And so, like... <laughs> Let's let's talk about anti-vaxxers for a second because anti-vaxxers are saying a lot of things that I think there are elements of truth to. For example, that big pharma uh, benefits from vaccines. That is true. And until we take patents off vaccines, which we absolutely should as soon as possible, um, and people are making money off of medicine, it's never going to be a fair thing where we can just trust trust the science or whatever because the science is influenced by money and that's always going to lead people to be biased in certain directions and that that works both ways whatever like you know i'm sure the the companies that produce medicines that you know uh well i don't know, like ivermectin i i heard was in the uh public domain or something like nobody's making money off of it but if somebody did then you know they obviously would be fighting against the vaccine people so it, it goes in a lot of different directions but we should always follow the money and i think that's something that we didn't do in the beginning of this is how could people make money off of this and uh, and if there's an opportunity to make money someone's going to take it and so we should be careful I, I just be aware of it and be careful. And that's all I was saying with that first post. I haven't talked about lab leak theory since then because, one, there hasn't been uh, – a lot of the evidence has been suppressed um, until now, until recently at least. Um, but I follow Brett Weinstein very closely, and he thought from the beginning that this was probably a lab leak, uh, and he had some theories about why. But they were theoretical and they were speculative – but they made a lot of sense, and he's an evolutionary biologist, so I kind of thought he knew what he was talking about. So I had this idea that it was a lab leak theory, but I didn't want to talk about it until there was evidence. Now it's looking like there's enough evidence that it's almost undeniable that it was leaked from a lab. And I don't think it was leaked on purpose, but that's possible. But um, I just think, like, you know, when you're testing, when you're doing this gain-of-function research where you're making viruses worse, there's always going to be uh, mistakes and people catch it and bring it out into the world and i think gain of fun function research is terrible and maybe i should do a podcast on gain of function research because that's that's where they they increase the the severity of the viruses or the contagiousness of the viruses in order to say if this virus got to this we could stop it anyway i have problems with that let's move on to the next argument so the first one is just that you might be wrong you very well might be wrong and you don't know for sure that you're right. And the only way to know that you're right about something is to test your ideas against other ideas, right? So I think that I'm right about, uh, you know, whatever, the lab leak theory. So 
I should look up other theories and say, okay, let's test it against this and see, am I right? Um, the other thing is that he talks about in this section is uh, about social censorship. So we're not talking about government censor censor censorship. We're talking about Facebook and independent private organizations censoring us. My podcast on Ivermectin was censored for a month. I could not get it through the YouTube processing to get it live. I tried three times and it's they're still processing. I posted it uh, this week and it went right through because now people I think are realizing that ivermectin is turning out to be a pretty effective it's got to be mixed with other things. There's a lot of things that go into it, but it's the research is suggesting that it's an effective uh, not cure but a treatment that that helps lessen the severity of COVID. So now it's free and clear, but that information was withheld. And so we're not talking about government censorship here, really, because we're, we're too busy censoring ourselves. The government doesn't need to do it. And John Stuart Mill talks about why that's so bad. So let's, let's look at, I want to read a quote. Um, it's kind of long. Our merely social intolerance kills no one, uh, roots out no opinions, but induces men to disguise them or to abstain from any active effort for their diffusion. With us, heretical opinions do not perceptibly gain or even lose ground in each decade or generation. They never blaze out far and wide, but continue to smolder in the narrow circles of thinking and studious persons among whom they originate, without ever lighting up the general affairs of mankind with either a true or a deceptive light. Uh, I'm going to stop there and just say, I think that this is really important. When we make it not okay to say certain things in society, those ideas don't go away, right? And I think racism is a good example of this because we all know racism is terrible and nobody wants racism. But we also know that there are some racists out there. If we don't let them speak their opinion, what happens is they go underground, you know? And by underground today, I mean things like 8chan and 4chan and whatever the new, there's a, there's another one. They renamed it like something else and Reddit and Reddit used to be like that. Not so much anymore, but they go to these places deep in the internet where they can find other people who have these views. So let's take racism, right? If you're racist, you can't talk about it with your friends and family and people out in the open. So you go underground with it and you find a group of people online who agree with what you agree with. And I mean, that's how terrorist domestic uh, terrorism starts and things like that. So it can be really dangerous to oppress those opinions, I think. And so I think we saw this when we saw Charlottesville back in 2016. You know, you saw all these people who, uh, you know, it was about a statue, but it was really uh, racist opinions coming out of the woodwork to support something that was all organized deep in the web and... And uh, all these people with these uh, alt-right opinions or these underground opinions come out of the woodwork. And so what I think I learned from that experience was that these opinions aren't going away. The only way to make an, an opinion that is wrong like that go away is to address it directly and have a conversation and try to convince people that there's a better way of thinking about it. And I think that... You know, Joe Rogan has said several times, the only way to get rid of, uh, you know, bad opinions is to replace them with better ones or not even opinions, ideas. The only way to get rid of a bad idea is to place it with a better idea. And the only way to do that is to actually talk about it. But that means that we have to listen to people who we disagree with, who might have radical, dangerous opinions, which Joe Rogan does very well. And... We have to actually listen to them and hear them out and then, you know, counter their opinions and their beliefs and their ideas and their philosophy with better ideas. Which kind of brings me to my next point, which is that um, the next argument that Mills makes is that you have to hear differing opinions in order to truly believe what you believe. So, for example, um, you know, with... Uh, with COVID, uh, you could say like, like, let's take the lab leak theory again, right? You could you could disagree with that, uh, but if you don't know all the evidence 
uh, in favor of the lab leak theory, how can you have an honest opinion? So Mills puts it like this. He who knows only his own side of the case knows little of that. Meaning, he who only knows his side of things doesn't know very much about anything, especially his own side. Um, his reasons may be good, and no one may be, have been able to refute them. But if he is equally unable to refute the reasons on the opposite side, if he does not so much as know what they are, he has no grounds for preferring either opinion. The rational position for him would be suspension of judgment, and unless he contents himself with that, he is either led by authority or adopts, like the generality of the world, the side to which he feels most inclination. So what, there, what he's saying there is that if you don't know what the other side actually argues, then you're ignorant, and your preference for your opinion is like your preference for red over purple, or whatever or this taste over that taste. It's just a preference and it doesn't really have any grounding in reality and truth and and real things. So um, unless he can test, uh, or uh, like you have to test your opinion, unless you put your opinion up to be debated, right? And if you're right, there's nothing to worry about. You're, you're gonna ha end up with the same opinion if you're right. If you're wrong, then you might end up more enlightened, you know, and learn something new. You might hear something that makes you rethink everything. Uh, this has happened to me several times. One of the things I like to do is, the, one of the reasons I engage in Facebook and, and things like that, even though it's, it's totally toxic, is because I want to test my ideas. I throw my opinions out there, and then I have people look at them. I made a huge mistake with COVID. I was comparing Ontario and Florida and I mixed up some numbers and I think I was looking at the numbers for Canada instead of Ontario as far as like deaths and cases and stuff. And so I was like, you know, like dumbfounded by what I, what I found. And then I posted it online and somebody corrected me and I said, oh, like I made a mistake when I was, it took me a while to figure it out. Right. And at first I was like very defensive, but it, but after a while I realized what I had done, I had used the wrong numbers because I couldn't figure out where this guy was getting his numbers from. Um, and I used the wrong numbers and I realized it and I took down a podcast because I included it in one of my podcasts and I changed my posts and I changed everything because I didn't want to promote something that was not true. And so it changed me by testing my opinion. Um, yeah, so I, I think it's a good thing to test your opinions and your beliefs and your whatever, your philosophy. And uh, that's how we know for sure. That's why I am so convicted of many of my opinions is because I have tested them. There's another quote from Mills in this that says, Both teachers and learners go to sleep at their post as soon as there is no enemy in the field. So we actually, the point he's trying to make here is that we actually have to hear differing opinions from the person who actually believes them. So like if you have a teacher who says, this is what these people believe. Um, a good example of this is I, as a Catholic, I heard what Buddhists believe all the time uh, from other Catholics, from Catholic philosophers and stuff. And then I taught Buddhism uh, as a world religion class, and I had to actually learn about Buddhism on my own. And I realized they were totally wrong about Buddhism because Buddhism isn't one thing. It's There's many different sects of Buddhism, and there's a lot of division in, within Buddhism. So anyway, on to the next one. This is, this is uh, my favorite point that he makes. Um, this one's kind of long. We have hitherto considered only two possibilities, that the received opinion may be false and some other opinion consequently true, or that the received opinion being true, a conflict with the opposite error is essential to a clear apprehension and deep feeling of its truth. So what he's saying here is that we feel like there's only two options, either my opinion, this opinion's right and this one's wrong, or this one's right and this one's wrong. And that's almost never the case. In fact, I would go as far as to say it's never the case. But usually, what he's going to go on to say is usually when um, you're arguing about the truth of something, it's because you're both missing something else. And so a lot of times I see this where we argue about things, uh, you know, that are contentious and we're missing – the one person's pointing out something that they're missing and they're usually ignoring it and just, you know uh, – 
or they're pointing out something that they're missing. You know, like like take the pro-life, pro-choice debate. Um, pro-choice people focus so much on uh, the mother and the, you know, instances of rape and incest and things like that, which are terrible, right? Or the lack of support after you have a baby. And pro-life people don't focus on that enough. I, As a pro-life person, I would say they don't focus on it enough. But on the other hand, pro-life people are focused on the when does life begin question and pro-choice people tend to ignore that. So both sides are ignoring some aspect of it that I think needs to be considered and often that doesn't happen. Let me continue. But there is a commoner case than either of these when the conflicting doctrines, instead of being one true and the other false, share the truth between them and the non-conforming opinion is needed to supply the remainder of the truth of which the received doctrine embodies only a part. Popular opinions on subjects not palpable to, the, to sense are often true, but seldom or never the whole truth. They are part of the truth, sometimes a greater, sometimes a smaller part, but exaggerated, distorted, and disjoined from the truths by which they ought to be accompanied and limited. Heretical opinions, on the other hand, are generally some of these suppressed and neglected truths, bursting the bonds which kept them down, and either seeking reconciliation with the truth contained in the common opinion, or fronting it as enemies, and setting themselves up with similar exclusiveness as the whole truth. So, after reading this, I think uh, it's true that the truth is always... <sighs> An opinion usually doesn't have the fullness of the truth, and so there's things that are missing. And I think that's important for us to keep in mind as we're, you know, discussing with people or disagreeing with people that there's always going to be little pieces that we're missing, and we can have a better sense of the fullness of truth if we, on a, on a certain topic, if we actually discuss it, and we'll understand the truth better when we discuss it. And I think that's so important. Um, he, one of the quotes I like is, not the violent conflict between parts of the truth, but the quiet suppression. Uh, it's this idea that the, uh, you know, there's truth on both sides. And to just like suppress one side, you know, like take the lab leak theory, just suppressing that and not dealing with the, you know, the problems that Anthony Fauci f helped to fund uh, the Wuhan lab. That's an issue that needs to be talked about and wasn't. Um, you know, that, that it came from Wuhan. We knew it came from Wuhan and there's a lab on for coronaviruses in Wuhan. That seems like a huge coincidence. So there's things that we ignored and we didn't talk about that got quietly suppressed instead of having the conflict and the discussion necessary to, to kind of work out the actual full truth. And it didn't help anybody. I don't think the suppression of truth ever helps anybody. I think truth is so important to having a good worldview. So uh, that's, that's really all I have to say about that freedom of speech. Um, I just think that people dismiss freedom of speech pretty easily, and I know I talked about this on a different podcast, but that was a long time ago, so I thought I'd do it again because I think it is the most important thing. I think freedom of speech is so important, and we tend to dismiss it and just discard it and say, uh, you just want to you know, call people with whatever name, and uh, I think there's a lot more to it than that, and I'll probably talk about freedom of speech more uh, in the future. Okay, so uh, this is The Underground. This is the podcast where we talk about the world and how crazy and weird and messed up it is. I'm your host, Duncan Michael McPherson. Please hit, please hit the, the like, uh, subscribe buttons, all that good stuff. Share this, please, on social media. Um, I'm getting more views with these videos, um, and I'm really happy about it. So uh, share them far and wide, and uh, hopefully we can come to a better understanding of the truth. Thanks, everybody, and God bless.
from the dark.